So uh, here we are, and let's now start with our first speaker, Professor Christian Brechot. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michel, and thank you also to Thierry de Montbrial, if I can have the first slide. Michel, as Michel has mentioned, I mean, we are still in the midst of this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, I just want to emphasize that we are facing these waves, and we do not know really the fine mechanisms of this natural evolution, but clearly viral variants, seasonal variation, and obviously the various precautions, as well as vaccines, are at stake. A uh, huge impact on health, on hospitalization, but also we should never forget the pending issue as to what will be the long-term medical consequence and the real impact of, for example, what we call long COVID. I believe that this is really something where we still have uncertainty. So what uh, will be the future? Well, first, we really have always to stay humble and careful. But for the uh, rich countries, we can really foresee a transition to low-grade pandemics due to combining vaccine efficacy, natural immunity, precautions. We will have new waves, uh, but we may hope for lower and lower rates of severe disease and death, but we have to pay attention to co-infection. But obviously, what about low- and middle-income countries. Uh, it's the year 2022 might well be the year of development of antivirals. There are new direct antiviral therapies, such as Molnupiravir, which has recently showed very interesting results, and others which are coming, and the results will be in 2022. There is very, very debated impact of non-specific antivirals, such as targeting the infected cells, and there is, I believe, the underestimated potential of the monoclonal antibodies, not only for therapy, but for prevention in persons who have been in contact uh, with infected individuals. Now, always is the cost, uh, the, the issue of cost and production. The treatment of severe COVID-19 has uh, been very much improved. And so, main and related question, and this has been addressed by Michel is really the impact of uh, global versus national strategies and related to this, the emergence, potential emergence of new variants. Uh, okay, the next slide, which doesn't come, is a slide which shows the impact of the, uh, the takeover of the Delta variant in blue over the other variants. We have several variants, I'm not going to list of all of them. Interestingly, the two so-called beta and gamma, which show some resistance to vaccines, have remained very minor species. Will we have new variants? Yes, as long as we will have circulation of the virus. Will they be sensitive to vaccines? So far, yes but we don't know really for the future. But the very important point is that we have the tools for real-time genomic investigation of infectious disease. And it's about organizing the on-site capacities worldwide for the sequencing, for the database, uh, for this pandemic and for the future. This is really a very important issue. Vaccines, I don't want to discuss all of them. Obviously, the RNA vaccines are the leaders. The overall efficacy has been re just remarkable. They prevent hospitalization and death. Less than 0.01 percent, sorry, of vaccinated persons are hospitalized in the U.S. And death from COVID-19 are mostly, mostly death in unvaccinated persons. Do they act on circulation of the virus? Yes, to some extent, but not complete. In other words, vaccines cannot be the only solution. And there are major questions for the future, duration of immunity. I believe that we will need second generation vaccines with longer protections. Do we need to distinguish the, which correlates of protections, which markers? We need large prospective studies 
in various geographic and environmental contexts, will we need to adjust to variants? So far, not necessary, but we have to be careful. So this has been discussed already, uh, and this is a key point, obviously, vaccine inequality. I just want to mention a very recent paper in Science, which is based on mathematical modeling, which really demonstrates the impact of vaccine nationalism on the dynamics and the controls of SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV and the uh, really uh, return on investment that we can get from a global strategy. So what went wrong? Many things, and Michel has listed some of them. I will just focus in a very few slides on the science, uh, medicine and public health. We need to have a scientific driven questions, which means expertise. Always remember that the virus was actually sequenced as early as January the 5th of 2020 in China, and by the way, immediately made public. There is the issue of masks and of diagnostics. Diagnostics have been very much underestimated and will be key for next pandemics. Uh, very briefly, this is what uh, an example of a global virus network center. You have rapid tests from left to right based on salivary samples, molecular tests, low cost, very easy to develop in low income countries. We have apps. We must very much more work on these issues. We must also have other organizational schemes. I'm the president of the Global Virus Network. There are other networks, obviously, but merging really the scientists of all over the world to provide a real expertise, not an individual-based expertise. And it's about research, education and training, which is key for the future, advocacy, communication, expertise, reactivity, and partnership between academic and industry, which have been always at the heart of the Global Virus Network. So I will close on two slides. We need to see, to embrace this on a more global basis. Uh, we, we will have, and uh, Michel has mentioned this on the day, we will have other pandemics, be respiratory viruses, there is the long-term resurgence of Ebola or others. We know that it's about the interface between environment, animal health, human health. 70% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonoses. They come from animals. It means that we must work on this ecosystem. It also means that when it comes to surveillance, we really want to target the human-animal interface, and this is a very concrete objective. But finally, we also need to incorporate nutrition, food safety and security. And this is my final slide. We need to integrate visions of different fields. Uh, it is now clear that the gut microbiota, this population of bacteria we have in the intestine, play a major role in the risk of COVID-19 and severity. And hence, it is really about the impact from left to, to right of the environment, on the soil, the ocean's microbiomes, in turn on the plants, the food, the nutrition, and in turn on humans and viral pandemics. So it's really about the need to work on some specific items which have failed on these pandemics and to really embrace this in a global context. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you for sort of setting uh, the scene, focusing on um, transmission, on diagnosis, uh, and bringing the One Health uh, and even broadening sort of the One Health concept.